Now, unless you're an insatiable pop music fanatic like, say, Brian Truman, you might think there are more than enough radio stations already banging this stuff out, what with Radio 1 and local radio and commercial radio, radio on the way. But on Sundays in Greater Manchester, there's yet another station to listen to. It's Radio Aquarius, a non-commercial pirate station working from a bedroom in Stockport and broadcasting from the moors one jump ahead of the GPO detectors. <laughs> You're about to be uh, affected by the Bob Lane program. We now take control of your radio set for the next 59 minutes, providing we all don't get arrested. We are going to have the Bob Lane program, whether you like it or not. We have ways of making you listen. Chris and Pete and Stuart, I can see the thrill of sitting here waiting to be arrested by the GPO men in the detective van, but what are the other charms of it? Why do you bother coming out here in a windy moor and transmitting? Well, it's really to provide an alternative radio for the people to listen to, because ever since August the 15th, 1967, when the Marine Offences Bill became law, all the offshore radio stations uh, were closed down. The history of Radio Aquarius has no clear beginning. The events which led to the setting up of Manchester's most famous pirate radio station of the 1970s can be traced back to the offshore pop stations of the 60s when the people who would eventually run Aquarius were impressionable teenagers listening to the incredible sounds of Caroline and wonderful Radio London and wondering what life aboard one of these ships would have been like. When the ships were finally brought to their knees by the Marine Offences Act in 1967, it was as if the end of the world had arrived, with the BBC's new Radio 1 service a pale imitation of the beloved pirates. Appeals to the government and petitions containing many thousands of signatures had failed to save the ships. Now it was time for more direct action, and land-based low-budget pirates began to be heard on the airwaves. Radio Free London was one of the first on the air, but broadcasting from private houses and flats left the operators wide open to post office raiding teams, so a new method of operation was pioneered by Radio Jackie. Battery operated equipment out in the fields with the programmes pre-recorded on cassette tapes. Out in those fields, the link between the station's operators and the station itself was much harder to prove, and if they could run fast enough, they stood a chance of getting away completely. In 1972, Radio Lancashire, a shortwave pirate run by 17-year-old radio enthusiast Charlie Turner from Hazel Grove in Cheshire, appeared on the 49-metre band. Assisted by a few friends, he ran the station for several months before turning his thoughts to a more local audience on the medium waves. In the spring of 1973, Radio Lancashire made its first medium wave broadcast, which Andy, who you'll hear a lot from in this story, came across while tuning around one evening. He phoned the number given over the air and spoke to Charlie, whose voice he recognised as Stuart Randall from the broadcast. Charlie thanked him for the reception report, and little did Andy realise just a few months later, he'd become part of Charlie's team. All of their transmitting equipment was homemade, operating on 1650 kHz just outside the medium wave band, and it was for his transmitter building skills that Andy was later recruited into the Aquarius team. For now though, he lost touch with Charlie. A few weeks later, an item on Granada TV's regional news programme featured the activities of Radio Aquarius. Soon after the report, the station proudly announced, next Sunday, Radio Aquarius becomes Manchester's first radio station to broadcast in stereo. Yes, next week, between 2 and 5, Radio Aquarius is broadcasting on 96.8 megacycles in stereo. So, next week, between 2 and 5 o'clock, turn your stereo tuners on and listen to the sound of free radio in stereo. Many letters were received, most of them complimentary, about the stereo content of the transmission. Some were a little more critical. Little did these critics realise that the broadcast had been in glorious mono, not stereo at all. They'd been fooled by the fact that the stereo indicator lights on their tuners had been illuminated by a simple trick, a 19kHz oscillator at the transmitter. 
It was during this broadcast that the local post office tracking team decided they'd better do something about the station and lay in wait for the Aquarius cars on their way down from Winter Hill. The raid was successful, the FM transmitter was confiscated on the spot and it was the beginning of an almost personal war between Charlie and the leader of the tracking team, a man known as Gordon. The Manchester Evening News carried the story on the 2nd of July 1973. It said if the pirates are caught they could face fines of up to £400 and three months in prison. It went on to say that Radio Aquarius started transmitting six weeks prior for a few hours every Sunday afternoon, but so far engineers monitoring the signal from a mobile detector van have been unable to pinpoint the exact location. It said that the pirates are able to move equipment at a few minutes notice and they can also broadcast from the middle of a field. Then under the heading Danger, it said it's known that some of the transmissions have been made from the Disley area as well as Winter Hill, the site of the BBC transmitter north of Bolton. A spokesman for the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications said the chief danger is when the station broadcasts on frequencies used for normal public service broadcasting. A serious situation could arise if they interfered with the police radio network. Another piece said Aquarius, which it referred to as powerful, was the result of a merger of three pirates, Radio Lancashire, Radio Atlantis and Radio North Staffordshire. This was actually a load of rubbish put forward by Charlie and his friend Pete Welton to make the free radio movement sound more organised than it was in reality. But let's get back to the story. The only other transmitter then available was one previously used for the Lancashire medium wave efforts, a large cumbersome 100 watt brute with a separate modulator. At this point, Frank, a friend of Andy's off the amateur radio bands, persuaded him to go and meet Charlie and his team, and maybe help out with one of the evening medium wave transmissions. Frank had been involved on the fringes of Aquarius for a few weeks, and he assured Andy that they were okay. So, one evening, Andy, Frank and John, another friend, went to a field in Woodford in Cheshire to help Charlie and Dave Pringle set up the transmitter and aerial. The transmitter had developed a fault, apparently something it did with alarming regularity. Charlie asked Andy if he could do anything, so he offered to bring his own 15 watt transmitter from home. One hour later, with the summer light beginning to fade, the little 15 watt transmitter was wired in place, and the pre-recorded shows were played out until the two car batteries were exhausted. Just as they were preparing to leave, Charlie asked Andy if he was prepared to have a look at the faulty 100 watt transmitter, and Andy agreed. Soon after, many meetings were held in the Mersey Tavern, a pub and disco in the centre of Stockport, and over pints of lager it was decided that Pars Wood would be used for the following Sunday's broadcast. The wood lay immediately to the south of the main Stockport to Didsbury Road, and was easily accessible by car. There were tall trees surrounding a grassy field, ideal for the erection of a quarter wave aerial. It proved to be an excellent site for the purpose, and for 13 Sundays in a row, the wood served as Aquarius's broadcasting base. Week in, week out, through the autumn and winter weather, they put the station on the air. The reliable signal on 227 metres quickly built up a good audience in the South Manchester area, and Bob's skill with tapes and jingles ensured Aquarius sounded out of the ordinary. Bob had his own studio at home where he'd fitted two BSR turntables, and a Grundig reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder served as the jingle player. Another tape machine and razor blade editing block enabled Bob to produce professional sounding jingles. He also presented a short Dateline programme which included all the latest news about other pirates. Back then there was plenty to report. With the North Sea in its second era of pirate ships, Caroline had made a comeback broadcasting from its old ship the Mi Amigo and Radio North Sea International was bringing to young Europe the voices of Roger Day, Don Allen and more. Charlie's show was mainly a top 40, with comedy sketches and the odd Judge Dread record thrown in for fun, and Andy presented a one-hour oldies show under the name of Tony Greaves. 
There was a certain amount of tension between Charlie and Bob at this time, the source being the difference of opinion over what type of music Aquarius should broadcast. During several transmissions, Bob had tuned to BBC Radio 1 and found the very same set of records being played and suggested to Charlie that Aquarius was a waste of time and effort if all it was doing was duplicating existing stations. He tried to get Charlie to adopt a less commercial music policy, but Charlie was convinced that the only way to get a large audience was to play chart records. There was a small move towards album music, but by the summer of 1974, Charlie had introduced the Aquarius Top 40, leaving Bob to play the more unusual tracks. In the early days, there were some interesting moments, but nothing compared to what was about to happen. One of these moments was the time when Charlie noticed a man walking a large Doberman around the area. After a while they disappeared from view and quickly heard the transmission disrupted by loud crackles and whistles. Charlie ran through the trees to see what was going on at the transmitter and saw the dog cocking its leg all over the equipment. The crackling didn't last long fortunately and Andy checked the tuning of the transmitter to make sure it was okay. The rest of the broadcast went without incident. London's Radio Jackie had been running for several years and Mike Knight, Jackie's founder and main presenter, recorded a special show to be aired on Aquarius, which it was on Sunday the 18th of November 1973. Several more of his programmes were played in the months that followed and these added a touch of variety to the sound of Aquarius. Medium wave signals from Europe could be heard really strong in the UK, especially in the afternoon when nighttime conditions began to make themselves felt. Aquarius suffered interference from the powerful Radio Moscow World Service. Although Aquarius's signal was strong enough to overcome Moscow's for a radius of about a mile or so around the centre of Stockport, listeners further out would only hear mess. On more than one occasion, they had to plug a microphone into the transmitter, and listeners were urged to follow them up the band. Now, if you want to hear the next chapter of this story, then follow me over to part 2 tomorrow evening, where things go extremely wrong for Radio Aquarius, as Gordon from the GPO orchestrates his first of many daring raids. Radio Aquarius would like a reception report from you. Please send your reception reports to... Radio Aquarius, Aquarius House, Albion Street, that's A-L-B-I-O-N, Albion Street, Manchester 1.